live from San Francisco, it's theCUBE, covering Google Cloud Next 19. Brought to you by Google Cloud and its ecosystem partners. Hello everyone, welcome back to theCUBE's live Google Next 19 coverage. I'm John Furrier, Dave Vellante. We're here for three days of wall-to-wall -wall coverage, breaking down all the content from Google Cloud's big conference here, Google Next 2019. Our next guest, Joe Cava, Vice President of Google Data Centers, spans all the data centers that Google and Google Cloud deploy. He's the man in charge of thousands of full-time employees, thousands of contractors, tens of thousands of uh, construction workers. He's building out the infrastructure and footprint to make the cloud work for us. Joe, welcome to theCUBE. Thank you both very much. So uh, Sundar Pakai, the CEO of Google, kicked off the keynote. The new CEO of Google Cloud, Thomas Kurian, came on only eight, seven, uh, 10 weeks into the job. Uh, clearly uh, the investment in Google Cloud, new building on separate from campus. So Google and Google Cloud are two separate groups that's been, been reported clearly by us and others. But at the end of the day, you got to run all this stuff on somewhere. <laughs> so, you know, you guys have deep, deep experience. I know personally in following Google and covering Google, uh, the excellence in engineering, the excellence in building out data centers. What is the status of, just quickly take a minute to explain how it's organized. You got Google proper, which is what everyone knows, Google, Google Search, et cetera, Gmail, and Google Cloud. Mm -hmm. How's that, how's that operate? What's some of the data points? Okay, um, so, as a, you know, the head of, a, of the teams that, that do everything from procuring land and writing energy contracts and buying renewable energy to designing, building, and operating all the data centers, um, cloud is one of my largest customers. But my other customers are search and ads and Gmail and G Suite and um, so really our, our data centers at Google are built for the entire Google enterprise and cloud happens to be one of our largest internal customers in that enterprise. Talk about some of the stats, countries, regions, data centers, what's the nuance? Because you have regions, you have availability zones. Talk about some of the stats inside okay. the numbers. Uh, so at the, starting at the Google level, we have um, data centers in four continents. So we're in North America, South America, Asia, and uh, um, Europe, of course. We have um, a, probably one of the world's largest global private networks with um, you know, 13 undersea cables that are our own and um, hundreds of thousands of miles of dark fiber and, and lit fiber that we, you know, we operate. Like I said, probably one of the world's largest networks. Um, we have uh, in, uh, in Europe, we're in uh, five countries in Europe, we're in two countries in Asia, we're in one country in South America, um, and that's at the Google, and in North America, of course, we have many, many, many sites across all of North America. That's at the Google level. Now, cloud has 19 regions that they operate in, and 58 zones. So each region, of course, has multiple zones in it. Um, you know, we, we cover, uh, Google has presence in over 200 countries worldwide, so really, it is truly global operations. So the, the 200 com, com, uh, countries is Google-wide. The 19 cloud regions and 58 availability zones, that's Google Cloud, is that's that correct. right? Okay. That's and, correct. Okay, and so do you not sort of mix uh, infrastructure for cloud and things like Gmail and Maps and Search, is that, is that correct? They're, they're separate infrastructures or? Uh, uh, it's, it's not so separate infrastructure. So when, I, when my team builds a data center, any one of our internal customers could be in that data center. Right. In addition to the Google-owned and operated data centers, we also have some sites that are leased in certain regions and cloud may be occupying those. But regardless of whether it's owned or, or leased, it's the same hardware in there, it's the same operation staff that are in there, the same expertise, the same deep knowledge about operating cloud environments. And so regardless of, of whether we built it or we leased it, it's the well, same and from a CIO's experience. from a CIO's perspective, it's the same SLA, no matter Absolutely. what availability zone it is. Absolutely. I mean, that's what really matters. Right. Yeah. Okay. Talk about the uh, scale, because one of the things I uh, I liked in the keynote, Sundar is awesome. He creates a great keynote. He used scale multiple times. He also had a, a clever comment around steel, which he said before uh, publicly. The amount of steel that goes into building this, this gives you guys large scale. You guys are building a massive. I mean, it's like smart cities almost. You guys have your own like yeah. country, pretty much. No, the infrastructure. What are some of the key learnings that you guys have? Because you have to be very efficient. Google likes to solve hard problems. You guys have done some things 
with sustainability specifically. Yes. Talk about some of the learnings as you guys have been building out these data centers for years with cloud on a massive expansion. Yep. You got to watch the environment, you got to do some things. What are some of the learnings, what are some of the notable accomplishments you guys are forging on and what are some of the goals? Yep. So at Google, we've been, um, we've been at this for two decades. For more than 20 years, we've been um, building and innovating on hyper-efficiency, hyper-scale, um, basically trying to build infrastructure that was more sustainable than had ever been thought possible. And then as our cloud business started to expand and boom, frankly, we set apart to um, build the world's most sustainable cloud. And really what that means is that, um, you know, we were the first company to announce that we were um, buying 100% renewable energy, new renewable PPAs to match 100% of our consumption. And in 2017, we achieved that. Um, that was after being carbon neutral for 10 years before that. So going all the way back to 2007, we were a carbon neutral company by mostly buying, buying um, high quality carbon offsets. Then we decided that no, we want to advance the transition to renewable and sustainable energy. So we started buying direct power purchase agreements for wind and solar. Um, and, and then in 2017, we announced that we had matched 100%. What that means is that we've acquired over three gigawatts of new solar and wind power purchase agreements. Um, and now we're taking it a step further we uh, have a very ambitious kind of moonshot, arguably, to not only match our consumption, but match it 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365. So you can imagine the complexity with this because the wind doesn't always blow, the sun doesn't always shine, and so um, that's going to take moonshot thinking in order for us to get there. But we feel so strongly about it, we're, we're so committed to this cause, that we've got dedicated team working on this right now. So it's not just squeezing PUE out of the data center, I'm sure you're doing that, but like you say, Absolutely. it's a Absolutely, we've been doing that since the earliest yeah. days. I've been at Google for over 11 years. Um, from the very first day I got there, I was completely blown away with the numbers that I was seeing about the PUE. And for maybe your audience, PUE is a measure of efficiency in a data center. And, um, and at the time, like back 2008, Google was achieving numbers that the EPA thought wouldn't be achieved until like 2020. And so I started to dig in and look how, and it was astounding to me the lengths that the company had gone to to optimize every single step of the way from the high voltage transformers in our own dedicated substations, excuse me, that, um, that are much more efficient than typical you know, utility transformers all the way through minimizing the number of transformations going from grid level, like 345,000 volts, down to server voltage level, minimizing the number of transformations, reinventing the way people think about cooling. When, we, when I got to Google, I was also amazed. Our data centers are running at like yeah. roughly about 80 degrees Fahrenheit. Most data centers run at like 65 degrees yeah. Fahrenheit. Our data centers consume about half of the energy of a traditional enterprise data center at the same size. And in addition to that, we're producing about seven times the compute capacity for the same amount of watts that enterprise data centers This comes from a, from a practice of you know, engineering, really purpose-built engineering from the day one into the overall holistic plan it's, of the It's of the frankly, build it's a relentless focus on efficiency and innovation right from day one when I got there, it had already been well in motion, but it's optimizing across the entire stack. It's optimizing software to be efficient, optimizing the server architecture to be more efficient, optimizing the, the power supplies in the servers, um, optimizing the racks, it, you know, designing the racks to be um, working with the cooling equipment specifically. Our cooling systems are unique to Google, um, they're, they're not traditional air conditioning units that you would buy for traditional data centers. Sometimes you know, we'll, we'll site data centers where we can use natural environment. In Finland, our data center is right on the Gulf of Finland, and we use cold seawater from the Gulf of Finland to cool the data center. So to be clear, you're, you're doing some, uh, quite a bit of vertical integration, whether it's your own transformers, or power supplies, right. and other equipment, right? That's right. Fiber optic across the Atlantic, as Sundar pointed out. That's right. You guys are doing your own stuff. Absolutely. And the efficiencies you pass on in savings 
to the customers and society with the, with the sustainability piece. That's so right. Two, if, two angles on that. It really, it's, um, you know, it's good business, of course, because it's bottom line, but more importantly, it's also the right thing for us to do. We feel very strongly that we need to be responsible for our impact on the environment and to minimize that impact and to be accountable for it. And we realize that the only way we can truly be accountable for our impact on the environment and for our energy consumption is to have it matched with renewable energy 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You know, not, not to take a sidetrack here, but you know, we've been covering the tech business for many, many decades, and certainly recently tech kind of got a bad name because of some headlines. But I always look for tech stories that, you know, everyone's like, oh, tech's bad for people. There's always good stories. I think this is an example of tech for good. You guys are taking real engineering, building large scale systems and, and facilities that have software running on it. It's really a tech for good story. So I congratulations yeah. on that. Thank That's you very awesome much. work. Yeah. Now yeah. I want to kind of ask you, put you on the spot here, because I think one conversation we're hearing a lot, and I want to get your expert opinion on this, it could be Google and also as a, as a, as a person in the industry. Security in the supply chain has come up a lot in terms of whether chips have been hacked. Um, we've, heard, we've heard things like that in the story. Some of them have proven to be misinformation and fake news. Um, but you got to watch security. Google's really hardcore on security, as you, you know, you live that. How do you look at the supply chain? Because you, you're not just throwing contractors at this. You could be taking a very holistic, ground zero engineering approach to a holistic picture. How do you guys manage the security challenge in the supply chain throughout the facilities uh, from chips to access, things of that nature. Sure, so there, there's two aspects. There's always the logical and the physical security aspect. From the physical security aspect, in our warehouses that we manage, of course we apply the same rigorous standards for physical security that we, we do at the data centers. And that's multi-layer and various different types of security technologies that we apply. And, um, but on the logical side, you know, I think you're probably familiar with our Titan chipset that, yeah. we, that we developed. And those Titan chips are, are put in all of our, our servers. Um, and from the time that they're built to the time that they're in the facility, you know, those, those chipsets are, are securing the servers. And to your from points. the logical side though, the, you know, my colleagues on our information security team are truly the experts that, that could address that. And that's where the better. software shines. That's right. Again, this is not just one, it's not a silo, you got to build physical build. It's kind of a bigger, it's, it's a holistic integrated model. It is, and um, this is, you know, from, from the data center industry perspective, for as long as there's been IT, there's always been the debate between uh, facilities and IT, right? When I got to Google, I was also so relieved to see that was all technical infrastructure. And the IT systems, the software that runs on those, those data centers are all under the same technical infrastructure group. And so, you know, yeah. it, it all, uh, it, the buck stops at ORS. Well, for years there was a discussion in, in you know, general IT about those groups coming together, and I think the way they come together is the cloud, frankly. Because you haven't seen a lot of change within organizations of IT and facilities really working together that That's well. right, yeah. <laughs> but. Well, Joe, thanks for coming on theCUBE. Thanks for sharing your insight. Final word, what's the thoughts, folks watching out there who are trying to understand how to bring IP and, um, technology into facilities in general? I mean, a lot of people still have data centers. They still have on-premise activity from light bulbs to whatever. Any, any learnings and uh, parting wisdom, folks watching that are in, in the facilities and or physical building space on how to build out these, whether it's smart cities, whether it's in construction, any experiences you could share with folks out there looking to build a holistic long-term plan? Yeah, um, there's, a, there's a few things. Uh, first of all, we've published um, all of our, our energy efficiency best practices, and so I encourage everyone to take a look at those best practices because the, the best you know, energy savings is the energy not consumed in the first place. So do all the right things to reduce the overall energy consumption in the first place. Two, we want to help further the transition to renewable energy, and so we've published a lot about our power purchase agreements, and a lot of the, um, the policy work that enables us to do those is also set in place for other large um, energy consumers that want to do the same thing. So our policy work can help to allow others to do the same thing. The third part of our sustainability aspect is really a circular economy. You know, we want to um, have zero waste to landfill, We've currently achieved 91% diversion of all of our data center operations. So 91% is diverted to landfill, but we have an objective of 100%, no, no, no waste to landfill. And then that means you have to do smart things like 
better reuse, better recycling, be, better reselling of products that are still good but maybe out of date for, for your use. And then just to end it off, we've really invested in our machine learning and AI intelligence, both on the data center operations. We have now um, ML running our, uh, some of our cooling systems in fully autonomous mode and doing a much better job of matching the, the cooling needs to the, the workloads at the time. And we took that same learning with our DeepMind group, partnered with them, and we've applied that to our, a wind farm now as well so that they can better predict what the output of the wind farm is going to be 36 hours in advance that allows the operators of the grid to better bring on more, more energy um, and get higher value out of that, that, that wind energy. Great engineering story at scale. Congratulations, I love the societal impact. Tech for Good, congratulations. Love to have you back. Talk about the impact of IOT. <laughs> Joe, yeah, thanks for coming on. Convergence at the edge, yeah. <laughs> it's all coming together. Wind Thank farms, the data much. center. Right. Data center's not going away. Obviously the cloud needs to run on servers and has to be done in an engineered fashion. Google's leading the charge there. This is theCUBE, live coverage. Day one of three days of coverage. We'll be right back after this short break.